Hi everyone. You'll have probably noticed already that in life, things can sometimes connect and come about in strange ways. Someone with whom I had a brief professional association in 2001, and who left me no fond memories of either his personality or modus operandi, did however give me a piece of advice which would prove infinitely richer in its consequences for me than the benefits any short-term collaboration with him could ever have yielded. Go to St Bride. Back then, the two very helpful library assistants were Denise Ruffin and Lynn Arlott. I think a moment of revelation came for me one afternoon when, in response to one of my requests, they laid before me the library's copy of the Cologne Chronicle of 1499. I'd imagined if I wanted to view such a piece of incunabula, it would have to be at a respectful distance while a white-gloved librarian slowly turned the pages. But here it was, being left with me to leaf through at my own pace and on my own terms, as it would with anyone who came through the doors and wanted to look at it. I couldn't believe it. My mind was blown. I was hooked. I joined the Friends, which had originally been found in the 1990s in response to a crisis about the library's immediate future. It had been more in the nature of a petition of support with a single subscription securing continuous membership. In 2005, I went to a friend's AGM when the library was in transition from being funded by the Corporation of London to being supported, but to an extent having to be self-supporting within the St. Bride Foundation. In this new climate, the subscription had been switched to a yearly one. After the meeting, I asked the chairman, Rob Bannon, what sort of take up there had been for the existing database of members. It had been disappointing, he said, but the problem was the friends had nothing to offer as an incentive to join or to resubscribe. What about a journal, I asked. Well, yes, it was, of course, an idea that occurs more already, Rob told me, but the problem was, firstly, funding it, and secondly, someone having the time and commitment to design and edit it. We're all sitting on about five committees already, he said. But if I was interested in trying to overcome those practical obstacles, they'd be interested to see what I could do. It was an offer that I found strangely irresistible. I'd worked on various magazines as a freelance designer in the previous decade and a half a few years previously had with a colleague put forward a proposal for a magazine to a major London museum, which had been given what seemed like the green light by a senior member of staff, who promptly left the following week. The green light switched back to red. But the idea of starting a magazine had stayed with me, and this seemed another opportunity. Talks at St Bride in the early noughties seemed to have the front rows filled with an older male audience who were inexplicably and perpetually dissatisfied with whatever had been presented to them and would take a gloomy relish in giving the speaker a hard time at the Q&A. But an annual conference had been established by Caroline Archer Paré, Shelley Grundler and Rob. It seemed different with a younger audience and a wide variety of approach. I remember a great presentation Rob did on the styles and possible philosophies behind the house numbers people applied or painted on the wheelie bins along his route to work at the University of Reading. This was a spirit I wanted to tap into. Alongside the lecture programme, the conferences seemed a rich motherload of potential copy. I could approach speakers and ask them if they'd be willing to donate their words and images as articles. I was confident I could supplement this with other ideas that might occur, that I might chance upon along the way. But with no budget, production looked to be the stumbling block. I approached the printers I'd had contact with in recent years. Would they print at least one issue of the journal for free in exchange for a back cover ad, their logo on the cover and contents page, and well, anything else really that they wanted to promote themselves to a potentially attractive audience? They all said no, apart from Principal Colour, who said they would do the first four on that basis. Crucially, they stayed to print the entire first run, subsequently only ever at a budget price. It was a pivotal moment. Now I knew the journal would become a reality. Once out in the world, anything might be possible. What to call it? I thought of a does what it says on the tin approach, to call it simply St. Bride. But the next friends meeting, Peggy Smith commented, probably rightly, that it sounded like a parish magazine. We fired off ideas and Stephen Lubell suggested Ultra bold, the heaviest weight of type. Merged into a single word, we had the title. I was then faced with the question of the design. Rob supplied me with the fonts, Jean-Francois Porchet's Le Monde Livre and Parisine, which the designer had kindly given the library permission to use. For the prospects of designing the potential readership of designers, printers and the highly designer wear, 
was slightly daunting, who as I presumed to define a graphic identity for the library. I decided to keep the design low profile, no playing around with headlines, no pull out quotes, just to let the material speak for itself and to present the images as favorably as possible. The logo had a little typographic play to it, but so subtle, it might not even be noticed. The first issue appeared in the autumn of 2006. Editing and designing it has never been less than a pleasure. One of the aspects of being an editor that I enjoyed was shifting the sometimes overbearing focus on the self, an inescapable and necessary part of the freelance professional life. It was great to be able to present other people's work and research and in the service of a greater aim, support of the library. But if people also said, very nice, well done, Simon. Well, I'm only human. And other ideas did come along. The 10th issue we drew on the library's collection, the power of the random to compile 10 items that had a connection to number 10. Encouraged by this, I devised some themes for the next three issues, mistakes, theft, and of course, for issue 13, bad luck. And people also very kindly offered material too. So much great content arrived that way. Despite my initial trepidation, reception of the journal was always largely favorable. And it ran for 18 issues until the autumn of 2016, when the then incumbent director of the foundation decided that it should be put on hold. This was generally understood to be a euphemism for terminated. However, to return to my opening thought, things can sometimes connect and come about in strange ways. A couple of months into what we're now calling the first lockdown, I had an email from someone who said to me in passing, I miss Ultra Bowl. And I thought, actually, so do I. Then about a week later, I had an email from Elizabeth Glaber, who had worked as a library assistant in the noughties. She was trying to get hold of a copy of the article she, she had contributed to issue five. I asked her about the thesis she was working on and commented that an extract would have made a good feature for Ultra Bold, were it still going. Which set me thinking. I contacted Sophie, the librarian, who, looking for ways to promote the library during the stasis of lockdown, had had a similar thought. And so issue 19 finally appeared in the autumn of 2020. There are two more planned for 2021 to support and celebrate the library's 125th anniversary. As ever, to everyone out there, if you have anything you think might make a good contribution to the journal, please get in touch. If the lights are on in the building, our door is always open. Happy anniversary, St. Bride, and here's to 125 more. <laughs>